Welcome, travelers of the internet, to Bright Helm Recording. This is your host, Master Barkle, playing the Pillars of Eternity 2. And last we left off, uh, our ship was wrecked at Velario's Rest on Maje Island by the notorious Captain Benwith, who may be over at a place, a Fort Deadlight. And if you don't remember, we're still trying to hunt Aethys, but I want some revenge first for wrecking me here in the first place. Well, I mean, I guess the storm wrecked me here, but, you know, I still blame him for attacking me. Uh, but first, we need to get some crew members, we need to get some medicine, maybe some ammunition and repair supplies, and food and water uh, for the road ahead. Now we can manage our ship. We have all kinds of resources to manage it with. We got a helmsman, we got a cannoneer, and another cannoneer. Got a deckhand, two deckhands, okay. And a support, we got a navigator, a cook, who is injured currently, and a surgeon. We can swap out uh, the cook so that she can rest and heal herself. Uh, we do have some new sails to try out. Some cotton weave sails. Give me some more speed. There's Seraphin. Let's let's talk with him first. Oh, hi, Captain. Truth be told, Ferrante half expects us to get our asses blown out of the water at Fort Deadlight. Fortunately for you, I have this bad habit of beating the odds. Well, that's good. Of course, I do that by way of good old traditional chicanery. Chicane. And the most important part of any Orn swoggle? Solid planning. Well, uh, that and surviving. Okay, so... How, how do we get into it? Uh, Deadlight's a tough coconut to crack. But if not cracking, what are nuts for? Mm. This calls for a bit of a clever approach, I'm guessing. Smart play for crashing any party involves scavenging yourself up an invite, and then dressing to impress. He puffs out his chest, thumbs tucked into the fine fabric of a shirt. They send out invitations? For what? Uh, no, Captain, they do not. He rubs the bridge of his nose and sighs. Well, I mean, don't, don't get my hopes up. Looking the part in this case means hoisting colors identifying us as Principe. His left ear twitches. Don't have to tell you how dangerous such a bit of fabric can be if the wrong person catches you flying it. Uh, okay, so we just go and raid a pirate ship and capture their flag. Uh, swapping cannonballs with my fellow Principe ain't my favorite idea you've ever had. But do what you have to do, Captain. You guys are pirates. I feel like you guys do that all the time with yourselves. Might be tricky to not damage the flag in battle, or sink the ship on accident. So, could we purchase a flag? Well, Principe captains don't just give up their flags for a few coins. He scratches his rump, head cocked to one side. Nakitaka's black market. If there be a Principe flag for sale, it'll be there. Mark it up and relocate every so often to avoid the Royal Guard. We'll just have to find wherever it currently be anchored. Okay. Well, let's get on with it then. Oh, Captain. Looking forward to watching you work. He rubs his palms together. Let's head below deck and talk with the others. Aloth. I don't know what he's doing here in the dead fire. Okay. Got some stuff here in my cabin here. Like a, a letter from Alfra. If you don't remember her, she was in Gilded Vale. Okay, it may tell us. I hope this letter finds you in good health. It has been many summers now since you first arrived in Gilded Vale. Much has changed in those years, but I will never forget the kindness you showed me. The gods have blessed me with a son. He is healthy and strong, and already so curious. All of Gilded Vale dotes upon him. I have told him of you. He asks constantly after the Watcher, who restored his spirit and hopes one day to meet you. Until then, know that we keep you in our prayers. Your most grateful servant, Alfra. 
Ah, uh, it's good to know that my, uh, what, what did I, do? I gave her a, uh, a tonic for her woes. Jyoti. Sheep sure is an adventure, ain't it? Just think of all the places we can sail to, all the sats we could see. This is nothing like being stuck on a farm, or cloistered in the back of a temple. Jolti wraps her sickle against her thigh as she studies the boat's layout. Satisfied by whatever she sees, she tilts her head to you with a small smile. Tell me what's on your mind. Um, should you be swearing so much as a priestess? <laughs> I reckon not. She grins wide and confident. But I can't help but be a touch wayward. Yeah, I can tell. I don't take it too far. My ma caught me once necking in the Merkberry stalks. And of course I fight. Mm-hmm. But I've not done much more than that. And I don't use the real ugly words. She waggles her sickle around in a helpless sort of gesture. Sometimes the feelings, they just come tumbling right out of me. God's darn it. What are your thoughts on Aethys? We talking during the Saints War or after he died? In general. Um I, I, I guess, what's the difference? Well, before he died, he was still Aethys as the majority of my brethren know him. Aethys embodied a human. And when that human got blown to bits, we all believed Aethys died. And I think a part of him did. The part he'd most closely woven into living flesh. The part that represented life. And rebirth after death. Mm-hmm. Which means the part of him that could have survived, that stormed across the dead fire seas, was the side more aligned with obsession, rot, and falling away. That which is death. Okay. No need to fiddle foot around. I'm listening. Have you suffered any recent nightmares? I did, recently with you. You were walking the depths of the ocean, but you didn't drown. And in your hand, you gripped the key to Aeora's end. The key to Aeora's end? Her face alights with a fierceness. I've seen stars wreathing a statue's brow, and souls flowing like tears over gleaming Audra. Mm hmm And then my god headed into the heart of the storm, where he could find the darkness. He could find the darkness. I'm glad we talked. You're a strange one, Joti. You're a strange one. Alrighty, Aloth. Thank you again for maintaining my story in front of Vanessa and the others. He gives you a grateful smile that fades almost as quickly as it appears. I didn't enjoy deceiving them, but it seemed simpler than the alternative. Simpler than explaining your involvement with the leaden key? Absolutely. I hoped you'd understand. He nods. Believe me, I take no pleasure in duplicity. What exactly were you doing out here? After we parted, I set out to destroy the Leaden Key. Mm -hmm. It's controlled us for too long. I wanted to free Kith from it. So for five years, I've been tracking down Leaden Key circles, searching for the places where they operate in secret. He knits his brows. Trying to undo them. Well, you're doing the right thing. Don't forget it. He gives you a wan smile. The task has been more difficult than I anticipated. Just listen. I don't think I fully understood the weight of the decisions I would have to make. Or the burden of living with them. It's it here, was much buddy. easier when I only had to follow someone else's lead. My father's, Theos's, yours. You had a sense of purpose when you began this. Don't lose that. I haven't. After we defeated Theos, I thought the hard part of undoing his work would be tracking down the Leaden Key's members and operations. Maybe he had an address book. Too bad you burned his robes. He gives you an appreciative smile, but his mind is clearly elsewhere. Perhaps this would be easier with an example. Okay. I went to a village in Old Valia, a run-down backwater river place. I right home like it was. Aloth's expression shifts as Isilmir briefly emerges. Uh, centuries ago, the Leaden Key had intervened to end some heretical cult. 
Mm -hmm. The details were lost, but what had endured was a practice of ritual bloodletting. A gruesome, pointless tradition. He grimaces. At every full moon, the villagers would feed the soil with their blood. No one, young or old, sick or hale, was exempt. Mm hmm. They must have had some purpose in mind. Yes, but the specifics depended on whom you asked. Some thought it would ward off Scan, or bring Bareth's favor on the village, or Gon's blessing to their crops. He shrugs. The village priest administered the practice. Grim old fellow. Reminded me of Theos. He raises an eyebrow at you. Wicked El Bonbag, tis what the lad means. He was a tyrant. I was certain that if the villagers were free of his influence, they'd be free from the bloodletting too. So I arranged for him to have an accident. He gives you a sly look. Clever. I thought so. At first, the old man died, and the villagers were terrified. They were convinced his death was an ill omen. They blamed it and every other mishap that befell them on their lack of faith. So they began bloodletting every week, turning on their neighbors for giving too little. His lips twist as if the words themselves have a bitter taste. Instead of a handful dying each year, a few perished every week. He's worked the edge of his sash into a tight knot. He clenches it between pale, rigid fingers. Mm. You tried to do the right thing, and that's what matters. Is it? In the end, the villagers suffered more because of my actions. He pauses again, untwisting the sash at his lap. You can't just expect to know everything that could possibly happen because of actions. Sometimes you just gotta do and worry about consequences later. I keep wondering what I might have done differently, or how I could have known better. Learning from mistakes like this is a good start. I suppose so. I should get some rest. It's been a long day, and you've given me a lot to think about. You still haven't told me what the Anmancers have to do with any of this. Ah, that. He massages his temples. I'm looking for an old leaden key sect. I've found several references, but... He breaks off, shaking his head. I want to be sure. Uh, please, let me go over my notes again. Then I promise I'll tell you everything. Alrighty, we'll talk more later then. How you doing, Adair? Hey, this brings back some memories, huh? How do you like Deadfire? The air is different. Especially compared to Gilded Vale, where there's more livestock than shovels. Mm-hmm. Sounds different, too. You wake up to all those bird calls, it really does sound like they're making music. If the birds woke you in Gilded Vale, it was usually a couple crows making the most horrible mating noises you ever heard. Ugh. Strange thing is, I still get this feeling in me like I wish I was home. That, that makes sense. Well, we'll get moving then, I guess. So, we want to buy a Principi flag at Nekataka, huh? There's some that's bound for Hanchense, and some that's bound for months. Heave away, Malendry. Heave away. You're sailing past a reef when Ikiwik, or Ikiwik, shouts out, pointing to port. There lists a ship stranded in the middle, perched on a narrow shoal. It tips and rolls with the passing waves. Hanging from its mast is a blue flag showing an image of a crescent moon sinking beneath the waves. Your crew gathers round, murmuring in low, excited voices. Chichupek rushes to the railing. Captain, that's a gift bearer ship. No telling what sorts of treasures it's got. What are the mad snorts? Gift bearers carry sentimental junk. Worthless stuff. No, that's a smuggler ship. It's a classic disguise. Then Easy spits into the water. Then it's a fucking stupid one. Gift bearers only visit landlocked settlements. That's a trap. Uh, thoughts? 
on Seraphin. Ain't a trap, Captain. Ship be too smashed to shit for that. Might be too smashed to shit for salvage, too. Seraphin scratches the back of his head as he peers at the vessel. Well, we don't really need to waste ammo. What was that about the gift bearer's aura? Aura the Mad fixes a pensive frown on the wreck. No offense, Captain, but the servants of Andra collect things people want to forget and consign them to the sea. Anything gift bearers might be carrying would be stuff nobody wants. I mean, gift bearers, be well, never mind, they weren't really gift bearers. They were disguised as gift bearers and convinced the guy to give up his valuable set of plate armor. Well, I guess we'll continue on in our course. Nah, we, we gotta explore it. Prepare a skiff. We'll have to row out and climb the hull. Turn around, guys. You row the skiff above the reefs, the waves tossing it, the bottom of the small boat occasionally scraping across the jagged structure below. You tie off a snag of coral next to the wreck. The water is rough and the hull slick with brine, but you're able to find purchase between the shifting planks. You row the skiff above the reefs, the waves tossing it, the bottom of the small boat occasionally scraping across the jagged structure below. You tie off a... Uh, hang on a second. You pull yourself up using bent planks and barnacles for holds. You've almost reached the main deck when a wave slams against the ship. You hear a crash from somewhere below as the vessel rocks. Your legs slip out from under you and your fingers dig, dig into wet lumber. Your grip holds. Once the ship settles, you resume your climb and make it to the safety of the decks. The ship is deserted. You don't even find corpses. If the ship had a skiff, it's missing too. You find several crates of supplies and several more of assorted odds and ends. Handkerchiefs, bead, jewelry, cracked scrimshaw, a child's doll... You think back to Aura the Mad's comments and wonder if this might have been a smuggler's vessel after all. Let us search for evidence. I feel like I've got the best chance. Then you notice scuff marks along the deck, as if the box of junk has been moved repeatedly over the same spot. You slide it aside and find a trapdoor underneath. It then rests a small chest brimming with golden skellies. Nice. What are they worth? Twelve piece. Among the coins rests a small figurine of an imp, of all things. Hmm. You load your find into the skiff and row back to your ship. It the ring of a bell comes to you on a cold wind. Uh -oh. The ring comes again and again. Until soon the air is full with the sound of a thousand, thousand bells ringing all at once. Spareth calling for me. You are alone. And then, you are not. An indistinct figure stands before you, flickering between forms like a fire cast shadow. A fixed, taunting grin. Bottomless black eyes. A yawning chasm in the earth. The aspects of Barith, the Usher, and the Pallid Knight shift in and out of focus. And at their back, four indistinct shades hover. You feel an eternity stretch out behind each of them, reaching back to places so distant and yet so near you cannot comprehend their size. The shifting image of Barith settles on the aspect of the Pallid Knight. Watcher. Her vo Her voice oh. is the discordant clangor of gongs struck out of time. I had a little bit of a brain fart there. I tasked you to discover Aethys's intentions. Tell me what you have learned. Uh, I can't follow Aethys around if you're going to keep dragging my soul into the beyond whenever the whim takes you. I will send your soul back to the wheel should the whim take me. Her wan face contorts into what on mortal kith might be called a smile. On her, the effect is more akin to a rotting pumpkin caving in upon itself. 
Hmm. Do not give me cause to doubt your commitment, Watcher. He's draining souls from veins of luminous Adra. The pallid knight knits her brows. He does not seek to return to the beyond. Intriguing. Her sickly pale skin pulls tight across the bones of her face. As if the shell of this aspect does not quite fit the impossible creature it contains. The figure nearest Bereth dissolves and reforms in the image of a thin-lipped ancient crone whose face has felt the melting kiss of fire. Mm -hmm. The goddess Wodica strides forward. Does Aethus frighten you, Bareth? He should. Margran subdued Aethus's influence once before, and yet he returned. From out of Wodica's shadow shuffles a hunched, bald man you recognize as the god Scan. His skin is mapped with swollen lash scars, and breath whistles through the ragged hole in his face where his nose once was. He does not speak, but stares up at Wodica with naked loathing plain on his ruined face. Wodica steeples her long, knob-jointed fingers. We must annihilate Aethys now, before he makes a rash decision we cannot easily annul. She casts a sly look at the pallid knight from the corners of her eyes. The moon would do the job nicely. You would destroy Aeora? For what? Spite? Wodica stares at you down her long nose. I would destroy it all in the blink of your wide eye if I believed it would benefit me. Empires can be rebuilt. Souls can be reforged. Well, that's kind of cold. Do not forget it. The figure beside the aspect of Bareth flows forward in a swirling cloud of ash. The ash falls to the tiles and reveals a molten-skinned woman leaning on a monstrous, wicked-edged broadsword. Magrin's glowing lips curl in disdain. We must find a solution to the problem of Aethys that is neither do nothing nor destroy the world. I acted in haste during the Saints War. You will not goad me into doing the same now. Hmm. To move against him while his plans are unknown would be the height of foolishness. We must find wisdom in precaution. I'll just say nothing this time. Another of the silent figures steps forward, and the warm, golden light of a summer's afternoon spills across your face. Let's all take a deep, calming breath. Perhaps cooler heads will prevail. Behind Helia's words, you hear the soft coo of doves. Aethys has been separated from us for too long. Isn't it possible he intends only to gather enough souls to reclaim his realm in the beyond? He should be welcomed. You look up then into avian eyes. Through them, you see clouds of starlings converge and divide. Uh, what if he intends to betray you? Helia puts a feathered hand to her chest. He wouldn't. Betrayal is not in his nature. Not in his nature. Scan shuffles forward. Yes, yes. We should welcome Aethys's return to the fold. His gratitude we can leverage to cajole him into divulging his plot. Why are you so goddamn creepy, Skain? Then, when he believes himself to be in our good graces, we do as Wetica suggests and crush him into the earth. Scan pauses, inspecting you. Just like you did to Abaddon? Ah, and here is the Watcher who killed Lord Harren. The man who tormented his dear niece, Alis. Curious. <laughs> it's better than what you were trying to do. Scan licks the ragged edge of his lipless mouth and grins, then turns to Helia. I did not expect such a deliciously ruthless idea from you, Helia. I am impressed. Good God, why is this guy here? 
Helia's feathered crest stands on end. You, you wretched little creature. Attempting to end Aethys may only make things worse. Your point is well made, little watcher. If self-evident, Aethys has not been known to possess a vindictive nature. Indeed, he has occasionally been magnanimous to a fault. Mm hmm However, if we push him to the brink of reason, there is no telling what he may do. He is, as ever, unpredictable. Something akin to fondness creeps into her voice. Then what's the point of this exercise? The Pallid Knight gestures for silence. Aethys cannot be killed, but he may be subdued. Yet to do so will take immense power and time. Both stand in his favor. Magrin grits her black glass teeth. That is why we must ascertain his plans before he has the chance to put them into motion. She begins to pace. Her steps leave little trails of fire in her wake. Magrin stops and balls her hands into flaming fists. Even if we manage to destroy his current form, there is the possibility he could return if he has not already absorbed all of his children. Absorbed his children? I don't understand. The Pallid Knight casts a cold, cutting glare in Magrin's direction. Magrin speaks too freely. That knowledge is beyond your ken, Watcher. Oh, all right. I'll just forget that, shall I? I am just a figment of your imagination. Wodica waves the gods to silence. Aethys gathers strength. His strength is a threat to us. Her voice takes on a sharp, almost panicked edge. There is no sensible answer to the question of a resurgent Aethys other than decisive final action. Something needs to be done. Your opinion is unasked for and unnecessary, but noted nonetheless. Though her tone is impassive, the banked fury in her eyes says well enough what she thinks of your interruptions. Why bring me to this conversation, then? We will act when it is appropriate to do so, and not before. The Pallid Knight steps away from the half-circle of assembled gods. She pulls herself up to a great height. The words she speaks next come not from her mouth, but from all around you. Follow him, Watcher. Mm-hmm. The black of the Pallid Knight's irises expand until her eyes are as dark and cold as the void between stars. She bends down and brings her ghostly face level with your own. Your debt to me remains unpaid. This is bullshit. She stares at you, unblinking. Like a needle drawn to a magnet, you are pulled toward her one compulsory step at a time. You blink open your eyes and find yourself on the floor of your ship's cabin, alone. Well. Yeah? Tell me what's on your mind? You need me, I'll be two whoops and a hol- Oh goodness. Two whoops and a holler away. Yes? Uh, how are you holding up, Bela? It's been a while since I've been able to speak candidly with anyone. Especially about the leaden key. It's- Unexpectedly liberating. Alrighty. Well, let's get back to it, I guess. He up me to teach them whales to dance. He away, my landry boy. We're all bound to go. Oh, the crew we are awaiting for the turning of the tide. Desert wind carries a sibilant susurrus, susurrus to your ears from the canyon ahead, punctuated by cracks and pops. It reminds you of eggs on a hot pan or a fire in dry brush. The low growl that accompanies it, however, raises the hair on the back of your neck. Listen carefully. My sharp hearing eye, ears, not eyes. The sound resolves into a rhythmic chittering slowly and cyclically rising and falling it sounds like a chorus of voices 
inhuman voices. Uh, well, let's continue cautiously forward, I guess. Carefully into the desert canyon, keeping to the shade cast by the tall standing stones. Ahead of you, a group of Zaurubs chat, hopping back and forth on skinny legs, shaking their spears. Nested between them rises the black leathery form of a drake. The creature's wings rise above it as it tears at the corpse of a boar at its feet. I guess they're sharing in the meal. Zaurips only need, like, you know, a few ounces of food. We'll just continue watching. With a mighty twist of its muscular neck, the drake tears the boar in half. It rises up on its legs, lifting its head, and swallows the back half of the boar whole. The lump of the animal visibly travels down the reptile's throat. And I guess the other half's for the Zalrips. One of the Zalrips hops forward. It tears its feathered headdress from its head and tosses it aside. It drops its staff a moment later and spreads its arms before the drake. The large beast peers down at the Zalrip, then with a flash of movement, eats the small wilder in a single bite. The other Zalrips cheer, <laughs> banging their spears against their shields. What? Just get in there. The Zalrips raise their weapons as the drake takes wing behind them. Such a strange show that Zalrips allowing themselves to be eaten. The auto AI is fairly smart. At least in terms of actions to do. They don't exactly move themselves. So what was in this place, huh? A uh, whole bunch of nothing, maybe? It's not a very big space. These may be like random encounter areas. They're just like meant for just that. Well, I guess we'll be out of here. Bones crunch underfoot, strewn across the sand are skeletons half buried in wind-blown dunes or lying bleached and baking in the sun. Their corpses still wear the tattered remnants of their clothing, their packs tangled in their limbs. Worms circle like vultures high above you. The sand is strangely lively here, dances as if caught in a breeze, but there is no wind to stir it. Several piles of grit rise above the dunes in suspiciously orderly mounds. That is kind of suspicious. Shoot an arrow at it. The mound of sand whips itself into a small storm. It rages across the dunes and it out outburst awakens the mounds of sand beside it. Together they rise from the desert as a swirling cloud and bear down upon you en masse. Well, I've angered the spirits of the desert and a few worms. I guess this is another ambush spot for them. We'll get him, Tonk. That was too big a trouble. Only the one skeleton. Yeah, not much. This. Oh, this guy had some loot. He had some healing hands. Sweet. You come upon the opening to a small cave. Putrid gusts of hot air burp from deep within, and you hear the faint chitter and hiss of Zaurips in earnest conversation. Well, I just go right in. Your boots crunch through a drift of brittle bones as you creep into the Zaurip lair. What? Oh, it's foot and every bullet I can. 
I heard the, the sound of something being discovered. Was it nothing? Wonder what we got in these caverns. Probably Zalrips and maybe a few drakes. Look there. I didn't really see any traps though. Sure. Follow him into a group. Okay. This seems like the spot to fight them. Let's do this. All right, we got a priest coming around. Go get, get that sigil of atrophy. Goodness. That thing is brutal. Can you smack it, Tonk? Can you do anything? Okay, guys, get out of that. Tonk, are you okay? He just doesn't understand how to deal with it. Say your prayers. Oh, run away. Well, that curse of atrophy. <laughs> Minus 10 might. Oh my goodness. That was brutal curses. Well, how do we take care of that? Man. Sure thing. Sigil of atrophy was pretty brutal. We gotta watch out for those things, I guess. Leave it to me. Alrighty. It's mine now. I don't think they laid any traps in their own home, would they? That doesn't make much sense eye to eye. me. Alrighty. Is that all to the cave? What is this? Mother Sharp Rock. From between the bars, there is a frail and sickly Zaura. It shrinks when you near, pressing itself into the furthest corner of its cage, trembling. Around its neck are the remnants of a bedraggled feather crest. Paint is smeared across its face, but the paint is old, flaky. It hasn't been reapplied in some time. The Zaurup's regalia tells you they must have been an important figure in the tribe, perhaps a high priest or a mother, but its condition makes clear that those days are long past. What happened to you? The Zaurup watches you with an unreadable expression on its face and says nothing. Can we, can we break open the cage? You tear the bars clear out of their frame. Just have enough. I'm down to 13. The Zalrip scrambles to get out of your reach. When you make no move to capture it, it stares between you and the open cage door, blinking rapidly. It tenses, then bursts out the door. Is it going to lead me to treasure now? Or is it going to try to fight me? The Zalrip watches you intently. Is it following me? I, I just followed it. Why are you following me? Yeah. Zalrup tilts its head slowly and blinks. It narrows its eyes like it can't quite figure out what you mean. I understand too, because I, I just followed you. It glances back at the cage you freed it from, then stares at you expectantly. Oh, do you expect me to be your leader? Do you always follow your leader around? Zalrup clings tightly to your leg and refuses to let go. You want to come with me? It stares up at you, unblinking, and finally releases your leg. When you make no move to chase it away, it hops up and down excitedly. Oh, alrighty then. Um. If you told me a few years ago that I'd end up following you on another crazy errand, I'd have said you were out of your mind. Oh yeah? Not because I got anything against you, more that... Trouble seems to come looking for you wherever you go. I understand that. 
Yet, here we are again. Probably on our way to die. Well, you already did, but me, I mean. He cocks his head to one side and smiles. I couldn't go having all the fun by myself. All real nice of you to share. Someday I'll have to get you a gift. And wouldn't you know it, this time is shaping up to be crazier than the last one. There's something accusatory behind Adair's eyes. But I gotta say, I appreciate how you've handled things. Times like these, staying decent's not as easy as it sounds. Mm-hmm. Thought you were weird at first, of course, but you've surprised me. Well, that's a, a bit of a backhanded compliment, I guess. Thanks. Well, you were having a silent chat with the dead dwarf lady when I met you. Well, I mean, strangers act strange. You can't just, you know, judge. It takes a special type to overlook something like that. I've been meaning to ask, though. How is it you never seem to lose your way through all this? What is it tells you you're on the right path? Ah. Uh. I, I, I don't know. I just... If I'm truthful with myself and others, I find that things tend to work out. Well, hard to argue with that. And I might get some strange looks if it did. Adair heaves a sigh that sounds as if it's been building up for months. His smile is tight-lipped, wistful. When I was a boy, things were simpler. Aethys was more like a character we read about in church. Easier to worship a god when their worst traits are swept under the rug. Yeah, I guess it was. Well, most stories had him helping folks or making the world work as it should. Mm hmm He adopts the smile and a gently pointed finger of a coaxing parent. You pray to him. He might help you, too. He lets the finger drop and smile fade. There was no cost to it. No confusion about his will or followers taken into extremes. Mm-hmm. Following Aethys was right. I had no reason to question. He pauses. It could be the light, but the creases around his eyes and mouth seem longer and deeper than your memory of them. Do you think there's any way that following him could still be the right path? After all we've seen? I, I mean, Bareth wants us to follow him. I suppose that's true. Not really a point in Aethys' favor, though. Anyway, I didn't mean for this to get depressing. Is that right? I think this was just a long way of saying, I appreciate the way you've guided things. Makes me feel like I'm doing some good, going with you. Shakes his head with a look on his face like he just remembered a joke. Well, I guess we'll get going. The Zalrup just gonna follow us out, I guess. Name Island? Well, there was a bunch of Zalrup, some Drake, and, um. Uh, really hot desert winds and all that. So, something like the Ember Sands. That sounds like decent enough name for this island let's be rid of it and there you have a exciting episode of pillars of eternity 2 where we traveled a short distance away from port Maje and did a lot of exploration along the way and got dragged into the beyond by the gods for a, a pretty pointless conversation i feel where they're just half speculating they're not even doing a good job of it uh, but it, it's nice to be exploring once again and naming these places. The Ember Sands, that's pretty cool. I'm a traveler and explorer. And this, this aids for the future. For the traveler sees what he sees. The tourist sees what he has come to see. This is Master Barkle from Bright Helm Recording, signing off.